examination of sex and intensity specific fatigue during bilateral leg extension exercise. First, I'll present the problem. Current resistance training guidelines for dynamic constant external resistance or DCER exercises suggests that training prescription should be about 60 to 85% of an individual's one repetition maximum to see increases in strength and or hypertrophy. However, these guidelines have been called into question as authors or researchers have examined low load versus high load resistance training to failure, low load typically 30 to 50% of an individual's one repetition maximum, and high load 75 to 90% of an individual's one repetition maximum. For these high versus low load studies, hypertrophy has shown to be equivalent um, whether, you know, exercise is performed at the high or low load. However, for strength, the adaptations are dependent on training status and modality. In addition, um, investigators have identified four potential mechanisms that underlie adaptations at low loads specifically motor unit activation, total volume accumulation, time under tension, and metabolite accumulation. However, the specific adaptation driving these adaptations at low loads is unclear. One thing that may drive these adaptations is the number of repetitions completed at these low loads. Um, this is typically dependent on the muscle action. Um, whole body exercises typically less repetitions completed compared to more localized muscle actions. Um, in addition, the repetitions completed vary widely. For example, at 30%, anywhere from 25 to 79 reps completed, while at 80%, it's anywhere from 6 to 14. <clears throat> Currently, however, the resistance training guidelines we use do not consider individual capacities, such as phosphocreatine stores, intra and extracellular buffering capacity, and muscle size. These, uh, these variables can dictate the total number of repetitions completed and may alter the resistance training stimulus. This leads to the inability to accurately examine fatigue during low load resistance training. One way we can examine low load resistance training is by using the critical threshold modeling. The critical threshold is a mathematical model that defines the asymptotic nature of human movement capacities for power or force over time. The critical threshold is the slope of the relationship between total work and time to exhaustion, and the y-intercept reflects the anaerobic work capacity that is suggested to represent the total amount of work that could be performed using only stored energy stores within the working muscle, such as ATP, phosphocreatine, glycogen, and oxygen bound to myoglobin. So this critical threshold is a representative of an intensity that an individual could maintain for a really, really long period of time. For example, uh, when repetitions are performed above this threshold, there is a definite stopping point, while below the individual should be able to complete theoretically repetitions for an indefinite period of time. However, the mechanisms of fatigue below versus above this threshold have been reported to be different. Uh, below fatigue is predominantly caused by central factors, such as decreased voluntary activation, while above the critical threshold, fatigue is primarily caused by peripheral factors, uh, such as metabolite or bypro metab metabolic byproduct accumulation. In addition, authors have reported sex, mode, and intensity-dependent responses uh, when repetitions are performed above versus below this threshold. Specifically, for a whole body exercise, such as the deadlift, women had a higher relative percent 1RM that their critical load corresponded to and were able to complete more repetitions at that critical load compared to the men. However, at a more isolated movement such as the leg extension, there was no difference in the relative percent 1RM that corresponded to the critical load or <clears throat> repetitions completed at the critical load. In addition, whole body exercise typically demonstrates greater performance fatigability um, as exercise intensity increases above the critical load. However, for single limb or isolated muscle actions, there's no difference in performance fatigability as exercise intensity increases above the critical load. Furthermore, there are various, uh, there are differences in muscle fatigue when exercise is performed at different percentages of 1RM. First, we have mode-specific responses. 
Um, there are differences have been reported for sustained isometric and intermittent isometric exercises. For example, EMG amplitude or muscle activation um, has demonstrated a similar onset of fatigue induced changes in the muscle activation and motor unit recruitment for both of these modes of exercise. However, for EMG mean power frequency, this signal decreased sooner during sustained isometric muscle actions compared to intermittent isometric muscle actions. This may suggest that blood flow may have been altered sooner in the isometric muscle actions, which causes increases in metabolite accumulation and subsequent decreases in the EMG mean power frequency signal. In addition, there are differences, uh, different pattern of responsive have also been reported for isokinetic muscle actions in the three different muscles of the superficial quadriceps. EMG amplitude had positive quadratic or linear increases. EMG mean power frequency had negative quadratic and linear decreases or no change over time. MMG amplitude had positive cubic or no change over time, and MMG mean power frequency reported no change over time. So you see muscle specific responses to fatigue as well. In addition, uh, there are intensity specific responses to fatigue, specifically muscle activation, uh, which may alter a resistance training stimulus at high versus low loads. For example, when repetitions are performed at to failure at 80% 1RM, muscle activation started at a higher level and remained elevated or increased throughout the fatiguing task. However, at the lower intensity, 30% 1RM, muscle activation um, did not reach maximal levels. The same is true for uh, 30% and 70% 1RM during leg extension exercise. Sex specific responses have also been reported for performance fatigability, which is a percent decline um, in force production pre versus post exercise, muscle activation, as well as time to exhaustion. So if we first look at time to exhaustion, women were able to sustain fatiguing muscle actions longer than men at low intensities. However, at higher loads or under arterial occlusion, there was no difference in the time to exhaustion between men and women. Interestingly, performance fatigability, or the reduction in force production pre versus post fatiguing task, and neuromuscular responses, or muscle activation, between sexes has been reported to be intensity and mode specific, meaning sometimes there are differences between men and women, sometimes there are differences at various intensities, but it was dependent on the mode of exercise. Um, as well as the intensity that exercise was performed at. So what we know so far is the number of repetitions an individual can complete is related to alterations in local blood flow, and this may limit energy reconstitution as well as byproduct removal. <clears throat> These things can affect, uh, maybe sex dependent, and can affect variables such as performance fatigability um, that are mode and sex specific. The range and responses may dictate the nature and magnitude of responses to resistance training, which may explain some of the variability previously reported for low versus high load resistance training. Thus, these sex and intensity dependent manifestations of fatigue indicate a need for the examination of acute responses to resistance exercise across the intensity spectrum with consideration of individual fatigue characteristics. The purposes of this study is to examine the sex-related differences in the performance of reps to failure below and above the critical load, determine if there are differences in performance fatigability during repetitions to failure performed below and above the critical load, examine the time course of neuromuscular and muscle oxygenation responses during the performance of repetitions to failure below and above the critical load, Make inferences regarding motor unit activation strategies used to maintain force during the completion of repetitions below and above the critical load. And finally, to use performance fatigability, neuromuscular and muscle oxygenation responses observed below and above the critical load to examine fatigue on an individual basis and determine if the performance of repetitions to failure below the critical load results in a lower degree of fatigue-induced changes compared to above the critical load.
For this study, subjects will come in seven different times. The first visit, they will perform a one repetition maximum. Visits two through five, they will complete repetitions to failure at 50, 60, 70, and 80% of their one repetition maximum. These will be used as the loads corresponding to above the critical load, as well as used to determine the critical load. And then the final two visits, repetitions will be performed to failure 10% uh, and 20% below the critical load. Before and immediately after performing reps to failure for all of the visits, the subjects will perform a uh, maximal voluntary contraction <clears throat> to assess performance fatigability. To determine critical load, we will plot <clears throat> the repetitions completed against total work where the slope of the line will be defined as their critical load. We will then take 10 and 20% below that critical load to determine the final two loads uh, that they'll perform reps to failure at. Uh, for performance fatigability, they'll perform two to three trials of the MVC at the beginning, such that two of the three trials are within 5% of one another for their peak torque. And then they'll just perform one post-fatiguing task MVC at the end of performing repetitions to failure. Muscle oxygenation will be measured using what's called the MOXI device. We're going to place this um, one on the left and one on the right, vastus lateralis. <clears throat> Muscle oxygenation will be measured continuously throughout the repetitions to failure during all seven visits. In addition, we will also measure EMG, electromyography, and MMG, mechanomyography, from the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and rectus femoris of both right and left limbs. The red and white leads are for the EMG measurements, while the center silver accelerometer is for the MMG measurement. <clears throat> to determine or examine performance fatigability, we will perform separate six by two mixed model ANOVAs. For SMO2 or muscle oxygenation, we'll first do polynomial regression to determine the nature of the response, so linear, quadratic, or cubic, as well as a 6 by 2 by 2 by 10 mixed model ANOVA, and follow our post-hoc student Newman Cools to determine the time course of changes or when the change in muscle oxygenation occurred. And then for the neuromuscular signals, we will also perform polynomial regression analyses to determine the nature of the response, linear, quadratic, cubic. Um, these changes will be normalized to the initial repetition and we will then perform separate 6 by 2 by 3 by 10 mixed model ANOVAs and post hoc student Newman Cools tests to determine the time course of changes or the onset of fatigue induced changes for these neuromuscular signals. Thank you for listening, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have.